Hey everybody, welcome to our live. This is our fourth fourth installment of the IG Live podcast we've been doing, Stuck in the House on Quarantine. Um, today we got a pretty special guest. He'll be joining us in a second. It's Jay Hernandez. He is an NBA coach. He's been an NBA coach for about six years. He also was one of the first uh, trainers to be kind of in that wave in like early, mid-2000s. Uh, here's Jay. Hey, there he is. What's up, Jay? Hello. What's up, Jay? How you doing? Good, man. Uh, I was just kind of giving a little background on you. So he started his own training business in the the early 2000s out of Long Island. Um, when I met him, some of his clients were Kemba Walker, Tobias Harris. Uh, his first NBA player was Wally Zerbiak. Um, and he transitions into the NBA. I'm going to let him go more into that, especially for the people that want to be into the basketball world. But, Jay, just give me your background in hoops, too. Um you obviously pursued basketball at first. That was the first love. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, I grew up loving the game and playing my whole life. Uh, my father was a, uh, a member of the Puerto Rican national team, played for 13 seasons in Puerto Rico. So early in my life, I, I lived in, in Puerto Rico with him, and I still have memories of him playing. Um, up until I was about you know, seven years old, he was playing. So uh, you know, I ended up coming back to Long Island. And, um, you know, just growing up there, you know, just playing all kinds of sports. But, obviously, basketball was my first love. And when I got to high school, uh, I commuted from the eastern end of Long Island, Bayport, Long Island, to St. Don, across the Bay. And uh, it was about an hour commute via car ride every day. So I would do that every single day, uh, one way and back, uh, just to play basketball and, you know, have an opportunity, you know, at a, a good education and, and get it all there. So, you know, being at St. Don was great because I didn't realize that, the rich history and tradition that they had there with the likes of like Jimmy Christian who's at Boston College right now, uh, Ralph Willard, you know, coach there, uh, Rick Pitino went there. So there was a whole bunch of guys that, you know, were part of that pipeline. And now my good friend Jimmy Moran is coaching with Portland Trailblazers. We played together. Uh, Sean Kennedy is a uh, top agent with Excel Sports Management now. And just a, a whole host of guys that went there. So I, I was fortunate to grow up in Long Island. I uh, always had to have a chip on your shoulder and play at a higher level to be able to play against the guys in the city. Um, you know, anytime we went there and played, you know, at any of the major tournaments, you know, you had to step your game up. So I was just fortunate to be a part of that, um, you know, around some great coaches and great players. And, you know, obviously I went to the University of New Hampshire for a year and then came back, transferred, had to sit out a year and uh, went to the hospital for the next four years and I had a chance to play under a legendary coach, Jay Wright. Uh, play with some great players alongside me with, like, you know, Speedy Claxton, Noah Richardson, and a host of others. So uh, just basketball has been a part of me well before I got into training. And, but, but this, as much as you love the game, and that was great story, and I, I know your work ethic, so when I hear that, I could just kind of picture how much work you were actually putting in, which I'm sure was a ton. Yeah. Um, but this was never a goal, really, correct? Like, am I wrong in saying that? The, the path that you went on, what, how did you even get into the training part of basketball, the, the afterworld of playing? Yeah, uh, I guess in New York, like, training wasn't a thing. Like, basketball training and player development wasn't even a term yet. Uh, my father was the first guy who started uh, doing workouts over at Iron Garden in West Hempstead, Long Island. Um, and he was just having me come down and like play one on one with the kids that he was training. You know, show them some pointers. I was still playing in college, and you know, Hofstra at that point in time had a good buzz going. Uh, so this is back in, in 1998 um, when when that started. And you know, a lot of the kids that were coming just weren't very good. They weren't you know very talented. They weren't coordinated. Um, and you know, a lot of the kids as I started training and I really enjoyed the process. Uh, Kids in New York were just like, why would I train? I'm already nice. That was the mentality. Like, I'm nice. right. I don't, I don't really need to, you know, have you train me. So what started happening was, um, you know, like the kids that we had on this, these side baskets because there was side courts that we were using while where they were right next to uh, the bleachers, and then the courts were right next to us, the main court. So these AAU tournaments would be going on and stuff like that, and you know, kids would start coming over to shoot, and they'd be like, hey, you can't shoot here. I'm giving a lesson. And they didn't understand what was going on. And the dads would come over and want to fight because I kicked off their kid. You know, it was all kinds of stuff going on. So, like, you know, it was just one of those things that you started really, started really humble beginnings. 
But what happened was all these people that kept seeing these kids that were working out with me that weren't very skilled started to look coordinated, started to be able to play a little bit. And, you know, I was taking kids from the ground floor up, and that's just how it started. Just the word of mouth happened. Um, you know, started getting better and better players coming through, and, um, you know, it just kind of grew. So I was doing that part-time. I was in, in admissions. I was doing pharmaceutical sales for a few years. Uh, I decided to go back to Puerto Rico to play. I told my wife, I said, I just, I don't see myself doing this for the rest of my life, you know, in terms of sales. Uh, I love training. There was nobody really doing it at a high level. Um, I had a dual MBA in marketing and management, so I love being creative in terms of, like, logo design, you know, branding, uh, website, all that stuff. So I, I, I just wanted to start something from scratch, and when people asked me who I was, I wanted to let them know I was a basketball trainer first. And it opened up so many doors for me once I decided to go to Puerto Rico play, had a really good season there came back, had some camps, and then I had about six months to try to make it work. And uh, luckily, I didn't have to go back. That's when I started uh, Pro Hoops and, um, you know, built it up, you know, back in 2004. That's when the company Pro Hoops started. I had another company called Best Prep before that, but the full-time gig thing was was all Pro Hoops back in 2004. And, uh, man, it just it grew from there. Um, and you were kind of, before the social media wave really hit hard, you were kind of kind of coming out of the game then, but you had made a name for yourself like before we even met, I knew who you were just because of the dope Under Armour commercials. For anyone that hasn't seen them, definitely go YouTube them. They were pretty sick when Under Armour was coming up. They had really creative campaigns and Jay had trained Kemba for so long. And what I was gonna get into is Jay does really creative um, drills that are awesome for the camera. If you film, it's really cinematic and it's it's awesome to capture. And I remember referencing those commercials in my head because I was getting into you know filming and stuff like that. Um, so Jay, talk to me about those days where people like even you were standing out before there was a, even a chance to truly truly market yourself and uh, how those Under Armour commercials yeah. came about. It always starts with the players. Like you know, I was just fortunate enough to have some good players walk through the the gym, you know, and I think uh, because I was in Long Island and I wasn't in the heart of the city, I wasn't in Brooklyn, I wasn't in the Bronx where a lot of the better players were coming from, or Queens, um, you know, uh, I think I was just one of those, like, you know, unknown guys, like, what is he really doing out there, you know, I wasn't really opening up the uh, court for a lot of people to see what we were doing, and uh, I knew I had some creative stuff, and I knew once people saw it, they would try to replicate it but maybe not understand how to utilize it in, in a program format the way that we had been doing. So, um, you know, just the opportunity when uh, some of the Under Armour guys saw the workouts that, that Kemba was, was doing, they're like, man, this would look really cool, you know, if we actually captured some of this stuff. Uh, my guy, Dorian Lee, is on here. Um, we had worked together for years uh, doing camps back and forth in Atlanta, and uh, the patty cakes, you know, the, 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 the high-five routine I see yeah, Kemba and I do, you know, we, I got that from him, and I started just to develop different uh, patterns, you know, off of that. And uh, it came really great because, obviously, Kemba's, you know, top three ball handler in the world right now, you know, so to be able to... Maybe like, ever. Stuff that we, yeah, so some of the stuff that we've been able to do and come up with, he was picking it up super quick. And I was like, all right, like, I, I just have fun with patterns. Like, figure out this pattern, you're a point guard, decode the pattern, and, you know, let's see, you know, like, if your mind can work quick quick enough and I think the more of those kinds of thinking and drilling situations you put those guys in uh, the better they can think and play when they're on the basketball court so that's how it started the Under Armour thing you know I think they were like hey let's see what we can come up with and I already knew in my mind I'm like I'm getting in this commercial like <laughs> yeah. I'm in this commercial definitely I'm giving them some you know, fire you know so like I remember the time we did we did some of the, the, the mitt work and I was hitting the guys with the mitts you know we did the uh, we had the uh, the hurdle handles which nobody nobody did before you know, we had to throw the ball under the 12-inch the hurdle. You know, we're doing crossovers and stuff like that. And uh, we had the resistance bands where it's like, you ready, Jay? I was like, yeah, let's get it. You know, so I actually had a talking part, so I got paid a little bit more to do the commercial, you know, because now I'm speaking on, on film. And it was, it was a really cool experience the way that happened. Um, you know, and I always joke with the guys that I came up with, like, had I done, you know, what some of these guys are doing now, and I love what, what some of these guys are doing. I know you've done some documentaries on, on you know, some, some really cool, great trainers that are out there right now. Um, had I done some of that stuff, I, I would have, not in a cocky way, I would have been well over a million followers right now, you know. And I just, I opted as a businessman not to have my stuff out there because I wanted that for my players. 
And so uh, even though it was the early parts of social media, when like Draft Express would come, they would do uh, videos, pretty cool videos of like the drills that our guys were doing and ask them what they were doing in the drills and stuff like that. And then I would see trainers putting it up, you know, online. And then guys like Jordan Clarkson would be like, yo, I just saw a guy doing your drill the other day. And, you know, kind of claiming it for their own, you know, kind of thing. So, you know, you just, you kind of laugh about it, but I was always like, all right, that's okay because they're a year behind. You know, if I'm showing this stuff now, I've already been using this stuff for five years, you know, four years, three years. They're, they're still behind at April. Yeah, so I just figured, like, as a businessman, like, Kofi's not going out there and saying, hey, Pepsi, this is our marketing strategy. You know, this is what we're putting in our products, and these are, you know, the products that are coming out. And I just felt like, uh, you know, it just gave us a little bit more clarity, a little bit more of a stranglehold on our business, where it's like, all right, we're going to go compete against maybe IMG Academy or, you know, uh, a bonus or some of these, these outfits that were big, big outfits across the country doing pre-draft. And I felt to us, it was like, hey, we got a small little three to five guys in here. And whoever we play against, we're going to give them the business. And, and that was just based on, I, I felt like, the training methods and the mentality that our guys had. So uh, I was just fortunate enough to, to get into the Under Armour early with the grass stuff, and that kind of helped build some of the stuff. Uh, before that, it was a VHS uh, video with Wally, that Zerbiak that I did, um, which I laugh about now. You know, I spent a lot of money putting that out. I, you know, I had some funding from Harvey Sanders, who's, who's my mentor, who I used to do my pre-draft workouts out of, and he helped me put that thing together. Uh, I had Mike Lardner um, and the Lardner family help me with the production of it. And uh, it was a really cool thing at the time because I had a, an NBA All-Star actually go through a full workout. We actually did not edit anything in the, in the video. Um, he actually went through it. He was missing shots. He was exhausted. And it was the best thing ever. And like he, he set the tone for a lot of what happened later on in my business because he did not care how he looked. He was all about the term I always used to say is make it ugly. You know, like, make it ugly. Like, if you're making mistakes in practice and training, you're supposed to. You know, if you're not, then either I'm not working you hard enough, I'm not challenging you, or, you know, you're, you're not working hard enough, and either one is not very good. And, uh, you know, early on, he set the tone for us with that as well. So the VHS came out, and that was out there. People were purchasing some of those. So I had some some stuff out there. It was really what I decided to put out there. And uh, obviously, we'll get to, to you and I, you know, at some point. Yeah. But our first document. Together, but um, you know, I really want to do cool and unique things like that where it wasn't just so saturated. Yeah, I think that's actually a, a perfect transition. I always wanted to work with Jay one because anytime I have a relationship with someone, I want to hook them up with exposure and stuff like that, especially if they need it, which you didn't. But um, once I knew I could film that stuff, I knew I was going to have a lot of fun with it. And just a little side note before we get into the doc that we did together, dude. The house that you used to train these guys at, just today on Instagram alone, I mean, we can't get into too many details because the guy keeps it pretty private, but if you check out our documentary, I posted it on our IG TV the other day, uh, Rep Your Work, there's this house that's in Long Island, and it looks like a one-level house, but when you walk in, it drops down, and the first level is a weight room, and then the back is a huge court, and uh, the opening scene of our doc has it. It's, it's amazing, and that always, to me, was like the coolest thing. It was just like a little basketball heaven over there. Yeah, unbelievable. Uh, just the way even that transpired again, it was because I started training his kids, and it was one of those things that I've always been a guy, like, I don't care how much money you have or who you are, like, you know, if you're, if you're training with me, uh, I'm going to give you 100% of who I am, you know, and, and a lot of times I couldn't navigate, I couldn't move from place to place to place because I would literally have like 12 hour days where I would have no lunch or dinner break and just work hour after hour. So for me to like take time to go travel and drive somewhere and then, you know, do one workout and then drive back, I was like, I'm losing out on these kids that I'm supposed to be helping. So just one day I happened to show up, I think there was a, a pickup game and it was uh, Wayne Corbett showed up, uh, Michael Strahan. <laughs> Um, you know, it was like Boomer Esiason. It was like a bunch of dudes in there. And then there was guys like that played D2, D1, D3 in there hooping. And it was just a really cool vibe, cool environment. And, and my guy Harvey, who I've uh, become really close with, and, and he's been a, a real good guy for me off court, you know, more so than anything, uh, was just like, hey, I'd love for you to come and train my kid here. And it wasn't too far from my house. So I was like, this, yeah, like I fell in love with the spot right down on there. And then as, as, business grew and this is years later he's like why don't you bring the guys here you know he just loved having like people that were striving for greatness in his gym like you know and that, yeah. that was the coolest thing about it 
it was just all about having those guys have an opportunity, and he gave me an opportunity because it was, it was my livelihood, too. Uh, but, yeah, he had everything that we needed. So when we finally started getting guys in there and get sponsorships and stuff, we had a kitchen, a weight room. We had a, a lounge area with a TV overlooking the court, you know, a locker rooms with a sauna. Just a great environment, and it was, it was just really like a basketball heaven. So yeah, so that brings us to when how me and Jay first kind of the first project we ever did together was back in 2014. And I was already kind of getting into the MMA world. I was filming fighters around the New York, New Jersey area, and Jay had noticed my content. So it was funny, I was trying to get in with Jay with hoops the whole time, but he was keeping his workouts private and was like, nah, I got a guy, I got a guy. And so when he was going to fight, Jay was... Uh, it was going to be his fourth fight, fourth uh, MMA fight, yeah. um, and Muay Thai, Muay, Thai. Muay Thai fight, Muay Thai fight, and yeah. that's bad actually. I actually know this. I'm an MMA guy, but it was uh, it was going to be his fourth MMA fight, and he was like, "You could document that. That would be dope. I'll let you come in and shoot that." As we start filming that, as everyone who follows MMA knows, the fight fell apart. His guy got hurt, what have you. Fights fall apart all the time. So we switched it. At that time, uh, Jay had pre-draftees that were training to go to the NBA draft. It was Jordan Clarkson, Noah Vonley, yeah. Tyler Ennis. Ken Birch. Yeah, Ken Birch. Uh, the Quinn Ross, Melvin Ejim. Yeah, Melvin Ejim, who plays yeah. with Canada. Yeah, so a yeah. couple other guys. It's like six guys. So what we decided to do is we decided to have a documentary on showing those guys do their cardio through Muay Thai workouts, which anyone who's ever done a Muay Thai workout, it's insane. So that's kind of the basis of the documentary. And within that, we got to film Tobias, we got to film Kemba and all the draftees. And it's a really good look at the process these guys go through. Um, and at least for me, it was a really eye-opening experience. Yeah, it, it was cool, and, and, and I, yeah, I, I remember you know us talking about because I was supposed to fight at uh, MSG Theater. Uh, it was going to be a big fight. It was a guy that had been um, you know basically beating the guys in our gym up, <laughs> and I was going to be the next guy in line to try to go at this guy. And uh, you know, I was three and zero. You know, I ended up really taking it serious. I ended up going from like one ninety eight to one fifty eight. You know, and, and training, you know, like the pros do, and then took it. You know, I had, I had some great champion. Uh, worldwide champions and, and national champion guys, uh, you know, worked me out. Um, you know, obviously, my guys at Militia were awesome, and Crew Tyrone, um, Cyrus Washington, aka Black Dynamite, world champion. Um, you know, it's just Chris Romulo from from Far Rockaway was helping me, so he was a national champion, bro. So I had some great people around me, and you know, I was doing like you know prison style workouts over in Queens, uh, outside in the winter time. It, it, it was serious. So when when we were going to do it, I was like. I'm going full full throttle. Like if I'm gonna, especially if we're gonna film this, I better I better go out there and really represent. You know, that was the biggest thing I was thinking. And uh, the way we we pivoted it when it, when it all got canceled uh, and incorporated what the fighter mentality meant to our players and how you know the, the draft process is cool and it's different because these guys are for the first time in a long time just all about themselves. You know, these guys are you know part of winning programs and part of teams and it's a team sport. And for the first time, they're going out there to compete against another guy for a million-dollar payday. And uh, to me, I took it like a fight. Like, hey, this guy's trying to take something from you, and you've been working your ass off, and you know, it's time to go out there and, and showcase what you've been really working towards. And so, uh, you know, we took it like that, and we built a good family bond with those guys. And, and, you know, having you around and having the other guys around, like Anthony and some of the other crew in there, being able to do some of the footage that we got at that time, I don't think there was anything, you know, like that, you know, from, no. uh, you know, a sports training uh, you know, the standpoint, you know, and it was, the way it was done, I mean, you, uh, you could tell me, but I, I still think, like, cinematically, it looks as cool today as it did back then. You yeah, know, definitely. It, uh, we... Point. Yeah, technology had already made the turn by 2014, so we were already getting really good yeah. pictures by then. Like, it made the turn, like, 2010, 2011. So, yeah, no. Uh, and the thing is, it's so diverse. Like, you get to see the fighting side. The fighter mentality thing was really cool to me, and it made a lot of sense in that camp. Like, I think we opened it up where you're telling uh, – 
Cam that he's got to speak to you know like you want millions yeah. you got to speak like they, like there's certain things that it's like all the other things you learned in your career it's like no you got to get it right because you got this little window to get drafted and it's like now you got to show these NBA coaches what they want yeah so that was really yeah. pretty cool if you're an NBA fan hoops person you definitely have to check that out um, what were some of the things when you look back on as a that you wish you could take back to training like now you're an NBA guy like what are some of the things like that yeah. that you would maybe prepare a guy differently for or something like that for the season knowing that everything is coming up like that yeah I mean for me uh, I always tell guys that I didn't know a lot of the terminology you know uh, the NBA terminology so uh, I didn't really go into a lot of specific sets with our guys you know so I could have organized uh, the playing opportunities that we had, um, you know, we would talk about pick and rolls and how we were reading certain situations, and we did a lot of that. But um, I think I could have probably put them into uh, more NBA specific sets. And so, um, looking at it now, you know, we could have probably still gotten the same stuff out of it. Uh, it would just would have been, they would have been more familiar with some of the potential terminology. Now, each team. You know, even for the same stuff for pistol series, uh, you know that a lot of every team runs. You know, the uh, terminology or the uh, you know the play calls is different anyway for each team. You know, but the actions are the same. So it would have been something that would have triggered our guys maybe a little bit quicker with the actions. Like, okay, I've been through these actions a few times, and you know, I can go ahead. But uh, I thought we found, we found a pretty good balance in terms of like their conditioning. You know, with the people that we used, we had Gail Bannister Mon did a great job with like. Uh, you know, all the deep tissue stuff. We did that on Wednesdays and Saturdays. She was great. She worked uh, as a core flexibility coach for the Jets. Um, you know, we did. We incorporated some of the running workouts. You know, I think you were part of that by, yeah. by Morgan Park and Glenn Cove. We would do the, you know, we called those the fighter runs. And we would do the, uh, you know, the Muay Thai as well. Um, you know, just to mix up the conditioning and the training. And you know, our guy, Dean Madalong, did a great job in professional sports. Uh, and, you know, I, we ended up capturing, like, catching some injuries that some guys had as well because they did rehab and strength conditioning. So, I, you know, I basically put the whole program together. We had Wendy Miles Sterling who did the, the nutrition. You know, we had her involved. And so everybody came together. And I, that was the one thing that I loved about it. It wasn't, it wasn't just me. It was like we, we put a great team together. These guys felt the love. You know, they realized like, hey, this is not just one independent guy just putting me through hard workouts. You know, so at that time I was still thinking – bigger you know um but i think just from a pure a pure standpoint basketball standpoint there was a certain knowledge that i didn't have from a coaching standpoint and it was mostly geared towards terminology and actions that's awesome uh and, and then it all that makes sense in terms of transitioning it's the the terminology is always i remember going from high school football to college football terminology was was everything in terms of just understanding what they were talking about because if you don't understand what they're right. saying yeah but so i wanted to go back what you were saying about zerbiak um and the misses in yeah. it it's a really dope idea i'm actually like was it's it's really cool. I don't think you've ever even told me that in terms of the idea of being showing everything. And I don't think a lot of guys, to be honest, would be very comfortable with that being done. Like, as someone who cuts a lot of basketball footage, most of the time you're trying to look out for players and make them look as good as possible. So you're not going to show, like, you know, there's several guys that are okay with it, but for the most part you're not going to want to make a guy because they might not want to film with you again. And what brought, what made me think of it again is in our doc, the Rep Your Work doc, Kemba actually says to the camera, so I joked with him, like, hey, they all go in on camera. And Kemba, I remember, said, nah, you got to show the misses. That's the best part. Yeah. And it's like... That was it, iconic. you know, and especially if you're playing ball in New York City, you know, and, and 
you know, the size that, that he is, or a guy like Tobias, again, a Long Island guy that was trying to make his mark um, and get the respect. And he was a kid that growing up was chubby, you know, a little overweight, wasn't the most athletic, you know, and, and you know, all these guys have something that they had to prove at some point in time to get to that level. And, you know, I think what, what we attracted was the kids that, like, did not care about how they looked in training because the training was supposed to prepare you for the games. You know, like, if you're, like yeah, if you were looking – smooth or good in, in our training sessions there was a problem that's the way we looked at it, it was just like either my the stuff i'm giving you is just not challenging or you are bullshitting today you know that was just the mentality so um and it started early and we we basically had a no-nonsense approach with all of our players the, the kids that we had coming up the pipeline we loved them but they also understood like you know like it was an environment to be be yourself you know that that's really what it came down to like every player that came in felt like they could be themselves and that was fine, but they also had to work their butts off. So it was a combination of those things. I think that people talk about culture. It starts with standards, you know, and what kind of standards you expect of yourself, you know, and uh, the mentality that these guys have was like, nobody, I'm not getting paid millions because I look really smooth in this drill, you know, or, you know, because, you know, uh, I decided I want to work out at 8 p.m. and I don't want to get up early that day, whatever the case may be. And I think, Again, I give a lot of credit to Wally Zerbiak because the story that I tell all the time is when he made his, his big money, his $65 million contract, he was playing with Kevin Garnett, became an NBA All-Star. I get a call. I think it was a text. It was a text saying, like, um, you know, I want to come in and work out. And I told him, I was like, Wally, I, I got a girls' clinic tonight, you know, from whatever. So I don't think I'll be able to work out. Maybe we can do this time. He said, uh, he said, what time are you working out? I said, it's like, whatever, 6 to 9. He said, you know, I, that, that works for me. I said, Wally, I got a girls' clinic tonight. You know, like, whatever. He said, are you going to be working on the bully moves and the, and the freeze pull-ups and that stuff? And I said, yeah, I am. He said, I'll see you tonight. <laughs> so I was like, this is so weird. Like, I, I literally have, like, you know, 60 you know, girls from, like, 6th grade to 12th grade coming in to this camp, right? And now I got a guy that just, you know, became an NBA All-Star, making his money. Yeah. And he's showing up. I get a call from another AU guy telling me, hey, I got a girl coming from the East End. It's going to take her like an hour and a half to get there. She should be there on time. Look out for her. She's going to be a D1 pro, you know, uh, prospect. I'd love for her to train with you. And I was like, cool, let her come down. Now, mind you, it's not an exposure event. It's a skills workout. Like that. We're trying to get players better. But again, at that time, not, not many people still knew what player development was. So she walks in the gym, stays there for 10 minutes. She picks up her bag, walks out with her dad, and she yelled, she's She's talking to her dad, and one of our trainers hears her say, these girls aren't on my level, and walks out. Oh. Takes another hour and a half drive back home in the rush hour traffic. Six o'clock was the start time. So, you know, that happens. Five minutes later, Wally shows up. Man. And now we're getting into the warm workouts, and he's in a line with like nine or ten girls. I'll never forget it. I wish I had this filmed or, or, or took a photo of it. Literally, you see... 5'3", 5'4", 5'2", 5'5", 6'8", you know, Wally, and, and, you know, and he's waiting in line with his ball, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my one move and then get back to the end of the line. So, so just from the standpoint of that alone, like, nobody could tell me anything after that. Like, I didn't want to hear anything. Like, if you're in the gym, you're there to get better. I don't care who else is showing up. You're getting the advantage. We're here together. Let's do this. So, fortunately for us, the, you know, the program just kind of took off and, and our, our standards were raised uh, on that night alone. Yeah, man, that makes it a lot easier when your pros are dudes like that. Especially, and I, I know Kemba and Tobias are, are awesome dudes as well, so that must have really trickled down the whole program. And I, I didn't know that the, the Kemba one that you told me about, like, I didn't see that until you, you actually clipped it later on, and I saw it, and, I, you know, I, I just laughed. I just thought that was the coolest thing ever, you know, that he would just tell you, like, nah, like, they need to see those misses, you know. And, yeah. You know, I think he, he understood the process. So, like, the kids got to know this is part of the process. I'm not looking, I'm not making every shot, and I'm struggling in these things, but that's what's helping me get to the next level. So Definitely. That was awesome. Yeah, that is awesome, man. Um, so the other doc that we did um, about two years ago, it was it was called when you were with the Orlando Magic staff. It was called 182, yeah. and it was your idea, um, and it was a great idea. And the idea was basically show what a coach's game prep is like. Um, you were game prepping for yeah. this the, a game that was like. Why don't you just explain that first off, and then yeah, explain what the idea of the doc was. Yeah, I, I, you know. 
I, we, it was called one of 82. I think some people were confused a little bit by that. It's uh, one game out of 82, you know, of an NBA season. And, uh, you know, you, you actually met us when we got off of the bus, when we landed in, into L.A., um, captured that. You know, the next morning you were you sat in on a meeting. Like, the access was, was amazing. I, I didn't amazing, think bro. Years that you'd be able to sit in. Bro, amazing access. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know if that'll ever happen again. You know, like, I just... It's, it's unheard of, you know, and, and even the stuff that we were talking about in there, like, I remember, you know, Frank Vogel, there was no holding back. It was just like, he was going in on somebody and all this other stuff, and I was just laughing, like, this is cool, like, yeah, and he knew, I guess he, he trusted me enough to know that I trusted you, yeah. that you weren't just going to just haphazardly, like, just put stuff out there that was going to make the organization look bad, and that was the main thing behind it, you know, but, um, you know, it was, you know, the process behind it was just like, let's look at one day. Of, of preparation, like what is what does it look like for an assistant coach in the NBA, uh, from from landing to the next day preparing, and what what do the timelines look like? The, the pregame workout, you know, you got to sit in and hear me talk to Jonathan Isaac at the time, you know, and we happen to be playing the Clippers, you know, so you see Tobias on the other end and the interaction. That was dope. Him. So it, it really, uh, it was really cool to see it all come together. So for the ball players that, that, that we have here, we cover a lot of high school hoops, so we, we obviously have ball players that we put up their highlights so they follow us. Um, and whether they're watching now or watch later, um, there's a scene that I just posted on where you're telling Jonathan, um, where you're watching film and he's going to a pull-up where obviously if he's 6'8 and he gets to that spot, it's going to go in. And it, your, your point is yeah. that if you're a great player, your go-to move should get off against any defense. Like they, the defense doesn't dictate your go-to move. As someone that could impart some hoop yeah. knowledge, what, do you, what can you tell some of these hoopers in terms of what their go-to move needs to be if they're going to excel in that, if you're going to be a great? Yeah, I think uh, most of the players that, if not all of them, that these guys look up to, uh, they have some very, very specific go-to moves. Um, and some of it is just dictated based on, sometimes on, on guys' athleticism, their frames, you know, their size, you know, different things that they had to do growing up as kids to get their shots off, whatever the case may be. Some of it is just dictated by their physical attributes, and others are dictated by, you know, what they work on consistently, what they get comfortable with. And uh, we always say, like, the, the measure of greatness is basically, like, you know what my, my strength is, you still can't stop it. And so that, that's what we try to get our players to do is, like, hey, be great at some things. Like, yeah, we want to work on a little bit of everything. We want to have your skill bank increased, and we want you to naturally do certain things in terms of movements and, and moves and games that, you know, just happened because the defense did something or you have to read and react, you know, on the fly. But, you know, there are situations where it's like six seconds, five seconds. What's what's your go-to? You know, what, what's something that you know you can do that nobody can stop? And so, um, you know, that's one of those things that we talk to our players about. I think sometimes what gets lost for young kids is they have so many different things that they try to do. Um, and, you know, they're not really great at anything in particular. So when it gets to crunch time, and it gets to like a real one-on-one -on -one matchup where maybe the other guy is more athletic than you or he's just locking in defensively and they're letting, you know, some of the fouls, you know, they're not calling some of the fouls and they're letting the aggressiveness, you know, play out. Uh, you got to figure out who you are and what spots you want to get to. And uh, whether that's with the ball in hand or, you know, guys are good without the ball too, you know, being able to set guys up, you know, fade one way to get to another spot and get somewhere. So um, I think the go-to is, is, is paramount. I really do. I think it's, it sets up your counter moves, it's, and, and once you have that, you know, we talk about breaking planes, and, and you get past the free throw line, now you have other decisions to make, you know, whether you need, you know, to make a pass, you need to finish, what type of finish, and stuff like that off of the secondary options, but primary, it's like, all right, look at Westbrook, um, you know, look at KD, you know, look at all these guys, Kemba, they all have like one or two things that they consistently do, even James Harden, when he's playing with the ball, right, he, a lot of it is between the leg, between... He's just reading, reading your rhythm, you know, seeing where he can get you leaning. Um, and, you know, for him, it's pretty basic. You know, he's not doing a whole lot, you know, uh, outside of that. So I think it's exciting when you see guys that uh, at a young age figure out, like, all right, like, I'm going to go to my right hand five times in a row, and I'm going to score ten points just that easy. You know, where I think just good players, not the great ones, they'll score twice with the right-handed layup. 
And then, you know, somebody will say, like, oh, you can't go left, and they're going to try to prove that they can go left and throw up a little sky hook or something. It's like, no, you keep going to, you know, get your numbers. Like, what looks really sexy is the 30 points in the, in the box score at the end of the day. You know, whether you get that from free, throw, free throws, layups, or catch and shoots, you know, you're going to have one or two other, you know, times where you can really break people down and be like that whoa moment. But the rest of them, for guys that really are scoring at a high level, is really being great at basic. Um, Jay, if now with all the knowledge that you've gained, um, been in the game for a long time, six years in the NBA, if you could go back and talk to high school Jay, what advice are you giving him for the rest of his playing career now that you've attained? Like what, uh, yeah, what message? Yeah, uh, you know, for, for I guess for high school Jay, we'll just continue to, uh, you know, continue to figure out ways to, to improve in all areas. You know, like for me, it was, uh, you know, I, I really focused on skill. And I kind of wish I looked into more strength and, and agility training. You know, I, I think that was something that I was missing, you know. And, um, you know, I wish I, I seek that out a little bit more. You know, I was, I played super hard. My conditioning was on, like, an unparalleled level because I would literally pick up full court and pick up games. And, and that was the way I got ready. Uh, but, you know, I think now there's just uh, there's more access. I, I didn't have the access that these kids have now, you know, and I wish I took it. I wish I had the, the ability to take advantage of the stuff that these guys had. I think if I had some of that stuff then, I probably would have utilized it more. Um, but um, I think, you know, probably for me it would have been more the speed and agility, you know, the athleticism piece because as I got to college or, you know, trying to play the pro ball, the athleticism is what, what a lot of times becomes a separating factor be, between being a guy that plays in Europe or a guy that can make the leap to the NBA, you know, because the, these guys are extremely skilled and they're extremely athletic, and that, that's really the biggest thing. So I think at that point in time, I would have uh, definitely tried to seek some advice from, from a strength and conditioning coach at that time. Um. Thank you, Jay. Man, I think that's awesome. Is there anything that we uh, left out you want to get to? Any uh, questions out there? Uh, I think I just asked your question, Tom, about 20 years ago, the advice he'd give young Jay. I just gave that. Uh, Coach Williams from Pocono is in the house. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, from, from, a, training standpoint, yeah, from, uh, from a training standpoint, I get this a lot as well. Um, you know, what, what, what I would tell the training part of me, you know, and I think – you know, for that for that standpoint, I think if, if you're training guys that are at a pro level or top level collegiate guys, um, I don't think it hurts to find out, you know, like who their coach is that they're working with at the collegiate level. It's a great way to network, you know, to see like who's their guy that they shoot with when they're at college, you know, and be able to talk to them about what they see, um, what areas they can improve on, you know, upon to, to maybe get more playing time the next year. Uh, to be a bigger role for that team. You know, same thing for the NBA. I didn't do a very good job of reaching out to the guys, coaches that they worked with when they were in the NBA. So, like, whoever Tobias was working with originally in Milwaukee, it would have been beneficial for me to know what was going on that first year when he wasn't yeah, playing at all. You makes know, sense. And, uh, I never, it never reached out. To me, it was just more about when Tobias comes back, we're going to get this work and we're going to get better. But it would have definitely help the process along if I knew exactly, you know, hey, he's not playing strictly because he doesn't, he's not playing defense the way Scott Skiles wants him to play defense. Right. And then, you know, things would have maybe a little bit more, you know, instead of, you know, 90% being offensively, maybe it would have been 60-40, you know, or something like that just to try to help him. Um, so I think that that's an important, you know, uh, factor as well, you know, for guys that are coming up the pipeline and trying to help their players. So. It's awesome, man. Appreciate you taking yeah. the time doing this, dude. We definitely got to get another doc uh, down the road. We just got to figure out when, when that right time will be. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to put my, uh, my, uh, my thinking cap on and see, uh, see what we can come up with. You always, so have, perfect with you, uh... year, you always have perfect timing. Last year you were a trainer. Last year you were with the Magic. So we, we had good timing. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. And we'll, we'll figure it out. But, uh, you know, that's why, like, I wanted to be on here with you and, and let everybody know who's actually following, like, just your vision, you know, like um, the, the content that you've been able to put out and, and the way you do business, like I've always admired that, you know. So, like, just to be on here with you and to be able to collaborate with you over the years has been an honor. And, uh, you know, I love the stuff that you put out. I watch everything that you do put out. Thank and, you. And, um, you know, I just want you know, continue to do and, you know, keep continue to do what you're doing because 
Uh, for me, you know me, I, I love to be creative. I love to see guys out there in all industries be successful. And I, I, I definitely take a lot of tidbits of information throughout everything that you've been putting out. So I appreciate that. Thank you, bro.